Welcome to a new video series entitled Strategic Capitalism. I'm Richard Devaney from the Tuck School of Business at Dartmouth College, and in this video series, we'll be gaining insights about my latest book, Strategic Capitalism, New Economic Strategy for Winning the Capitalist Cold War. These short videos are interviews with senior executives and CEOs from a variety of industries talking about what it will take for America to win the capitalist Cold War. We've watched so much turmoil about what to do with our deficit um, and how to balance the budget, um, how to replace the loss of manufacturing in, in the United States. What are the key things that you would recommend uh, that Congress and the President take up? Well, I started this using an analogy because I think this is getting lost on a lot of people, and that is uh, in hockey, they tell you don't skate to the puck but skate to where the puck will be. And I think as it relates to manufacturing competitiveness and manufacturing jobs, we have people too focused on where the puck was. It's not about the job what that was there. It's about the job that's going to be there in this new age, this new economy. And I, I think we need to really focus on, on assuring that we have the foundational elements to support that. Uh, clearly, uh, we need free trade. Clearly, we need a set of rules that um, we can all count on. And I would argue that, the, uh, that also incent the right type of behavior. But th this um, not knowing from day to day whether we even have a budget, uh, whether we're going to have a tax that's X versus Y, I, I think politicians just greatly uh, underestimate the contagion that that causes, the, the way it causes everybody to freeze up and not invest the way they, they possibly could. And then clearly we need an education system that's stronger, especially in the math and sciences. Uh, if we're going to, to skate to where the puck is going to be, you, you need a much higher educated workforce. It's not going to be, um, we're just not going to have jobs where you're turning wrenches like we used to be. Do you think that that'll be enough? Because the Chinese and the Indians will be well-educated, already are, producing some of the best engineers in the world. It is, is, that a, is that really enough for us? We have a convoluted um, approach here where we allow the best and brightest from these countries to come to the U.S., get the best education, and then we say you have to go home. What you want is the best and brightest to come here to have a, a, an education, to have a commitment for a period of time before they can go back to work in the U.S. And hopefully some of these best and brightest, based on past performance, this is proven, they'll be the innovators and developer of businesses that will continue to grow the economy for us as well. What should the government do to encourage firms to create more jobs in the United States? What you can do to in incent uh, manufacturing in the U.S. and therefore jobs in the U.S. is you can create a climate that allows the economy to be vibrant and growing and is supportive of manufacturing, uh, supportive of companies. So, you know, as we were talking earlier, you know, uh, free trade, uh, a fair tax code, but one that is consistent and is well known and doesn't change, that it allows everybody to, to plan. An item for me that I think uh, would be a positive is put in uh, accelerated depreciation on a permanent basis. You know, uh, we put it in one year and then another year. Well, we don't, uh, we don't spend 10, 15, 20 million dollars on a piece of equipment for one year. We do it based on a plan for the next five, 10 years of what we need. If you knew that was going to be there all the time, you would continue to invest uh, much more regularly in, in, from that standpoint. What kind of R&D could the government invest in that would help your business and your industry? I prefer not to have the government invest in R&D. I, I do think the national labs are great treasures, and the national labs ought to be, um, that we ought to not make it difficult for them to work with companies and universities in a collaborative fashion in order to spur innovation and growth. Um, but I would rather uh, let the, the government create an environment that incents uh, companies 
to, to do the R&D development because I think that's where it is most efficient and because the companies are much more tied to the customer base and understanding what the customer needs, it can be much more effective and efficient. Do you believe that the United States should have an industrial policy? Uh, yes, very much I do. Um, and I think it gets back to the industrial policy ought to be more about creating foundational elements that allow um, the, the country to flourish no matter where uh, the next innovation comes from. So encourage uh, development of it in the U.S., have the skill sets that allow, whether it's a technology investment or if it happens to be a manufacturing investment, that you have the capabilities here to support it, that uh, you have, um, I, I think the, uh, the government can uh, help from an infrastructure standpoint, because our infrastructure is in really bad shape. It can help um, from a uh, transportation and logistics standpoint, ensuring that that, uh, that is all in place. But I, I'm, I'm not one that, that sees major advantages in uh, the government taking major ownership of R&D efforts, other than in the support of national defense. How should the U.S. government balance the need of corporations to keep a good relationship with China in order to protect our investments that have been made there and uh, versus the coming uh, kinds of tensions that will take place between a rising power and the established power? The idea that some believe that you know, China is not going to become the largest economy, I, I think is putting your hand in, head in the sand. It is going to become the largest economy. It's just the law of, of numbers. When you have 1.3 billion people and you're growing at the rate they are, that's going to happen. I, I think what the, the government needs to be able to do is, first off, not play companies off of one another or off of what's going on in China, but have a consistent but firm approach. Um, I think too many times uh, the government, as it relates to China, has not been consistent in being firm. They have gotten uh, allowed various factions to get uh, emotional and rhetoric to get going in that people in China don't know how to interpret it, um, as opposed to a consistent firm message. In fact, I liken this to something China does. You know, China puts together five-year plans. The U.S. would be well served to have a five-year plan that they continually execute against relative to China and continue with certain talking messages. As long as you do this, we will do this. If you don't do this, we are going to do this. I think the biggest thing you don't want to do with China, which we can be guilty of from time to time, is we, we come from out of left field or a surprise. Uh, China, my opinion from what I've seen, um, China works better when you can be consistent in the message and it's not a surprising message. How does what John Deere does in India or China and the investments that you're making there help Americans? When a company like John Deere, that is certainly a ver very much a U.S.-based company, can go to a place like India or China and set up an operation, but incorporating it the John Deere values, it helps people not only directly that work for us in that area, but the city leaders and the government officials that we, the, that we meet with both better understand Americans and John Deere um, as well as, I think, develop more of an affinity uh, for all of us. And so uh, we, we can be great um, marketeers for the U.S. and the U.S. Uh, uh, population as we deal, or, or great ambassadors said another way, much like uh, the GIs have been all around the world. And uh, that role is not lost on us, that that's an opportunity.